Hi, and welcome to the Stefan Levera podcast focused on Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Be a better Bitcoiner by improving your knowledge about the technology and economics of Bitcoin. Today, my guest is one of the founders of Samurai Wallet. He is operating under the pseudonym Samurai Wallet, and he first appeared on the show back in SLP 29. So make sure you go back and check out that episode before you see this one. They're doing some really interesting things in terms of releasing the Samurai Wallet backend dojo and offering Whirlpool, which is their CoinJoin implementation. But first, a few quick words for my sponsors. Firstly, Kraken. So over my years in Bitcoin, I've been impressed with the way Kraken operate in terms of offering strong security and acting ethically in the space under Jesse Powell's principled leadership. They're one of the longest standing Bitcoin exchanges and they're consistently rated the best with a high quality platform offering the best liquidity in the industry. They've got high trading volume and low fees with no minimum or hidden fees. Kraken have 24-7 support, and I found it extremely fast to go through the sign-up process as an individual. On the institutional and business solution side, they're very popular with institutions too, ranging from funds, asset managers, trading firms, crypto businesses. They offer the highest available API rate limits, and there's a Kraken OTC desk. Kraken offer five fiat currencies and also offer margin and futures trading. To learn more and sign up, go to the Kraken link in the show notes. Secondly, announcing another sponsor, Unchained Capital. Have you looked into Unchained Capital? They're a Bitcoin financial services company offering a really cool two of three keys multi-signature vault product. You can use Trezor or Ledger wallets and you still maintain control with your two keys and reduce the single point of failure risk. Multi-signature helps protect you against the proverbial $5 wrench attack as you can distribute your keys. I've set up a vault with Unchained and found it super simple and easy. Customers who create an Unchained vault also get three free months of access to Safety and Immerse's Bitcoin Standard Research Bulletin, which is a fantastic resource for my listeners interested in Austrian economics. Unchained also offers Bitcoin collateralized loans, allowing you to get USD liquidity without selling your Bitcoins, meaning you don't trigger a capital gains event. You have to consider your own scenario, but this can be tax efficient for a hodler, enabling them to continue their hodling rather than selling Bitcoins. While a loan is outstanding, your Bitcoin is secured in a dedicated multi-sig address under collaborative custody with Unchained holding one of three keys, you hold a second key, and Unchained's independent third-party key agent holding the third key. So to learn more and sign up, go to unchained-capital.com. So with that said, on to the interview. Samurai Wallet, mate, it's a pleasure to have you back on. There's been a fair few things that have happened since the last time you were on, hey? It's great to be back with you. I, I enjoyed our time on here uh, so much last time. and I've been looking forward to coming back. So thank you for having me. Excellent. So look, I think just for the listeners who haven't heard, make sure you go back and check out SLP29, which was our first appearance together. And look, Samurai Wallet, I think of you guys as Bitcoin for the streets, right? You have this slightly different vision to how many other Bitcoin companies and services operate because they operate in a more sort of KYC fashion. So can you tell us a little bit about your vision of this and how Bitcoin can be used in this way? Uh, sh- sure. Yeah, I think uh, a slightly different vision to say the least. We believe wholeheartedly that you know, KYC is a creeping disease. You know, there, there was once a time that I, I remember, it wasn't that long ago, where you could open a bank account, get a job, rent an apartment without having to prove who you were, where you lived and how you got your money. Now that concept is so foreign and so alien to almost everyone that, you know, they can't picture a world without such practices. To us, this is the perfect, perfect example of social engineering, like on an international scale. Uh, the, to us, the, the, you know, Bitcoin and KYC, AML, they're like oil and water. They don't mix. Shouldn't be accepted and embrace it uh, and embrace it. And, uh, I think service providers take, you know, have to take some blame, but users also have to take some blame. You know, they, they have accepted these conditions. Their, their implicit acceptance validates the creeping disease, you know, it, it feeds it. I don't want to go on too much about it because I think it, our views are pretty clear on it. And I, I feel like I'm the old man yelling at the clouds, but I'm, I'm from the generation of Bitcoiners that view Bitcoin as the ultimate opt out from state controlled money system or fiat or, you know, whatever you want to call it. And I don't understand how one can opt out of state controlled money by opting into state controlled and mandated identification processing. Right. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a, 
I, I definitely hear that. Obviously, you know, it's not like I agree with many of the regulations or any of them really, uh, but it's, I guess, it's just a difficulty that many people face. In for a quick example, would be how can they get a lot of bitcoins without KYCing? And I suppose the answer will be non KYC services, things like BISC, HODL, HODL, and so on. Uh, but I guess the volume on those is still building, isn't it? Yeah, volume still building, and and you know they're those platforms haven't had a chance really to to develop as quickly as they otherwise might have if like i said consumers weren't so willing to accept and and in some cases embrace the KYC AML side of things like we've been talking about this at Samurai since 2015 uh, we we called it creeping KYC and it was when non-custodial wallets like uh, blockchain and mycelium and you know other all of them almost, they started partnering with KYC fiat bridges. And this was like, you know, the only, I guess the only thing they could think of in order to generate some revenue for the product, for the wallet, which, you know, uh, monetizing a Bitcoin wallet has been a, a questionable prospect at best. I think we've done a, a good job of it so far, but it's still questionable. And this, this uh, you know, it betrays a fundamental misunderstanding. Bitcoin isn't Venmo, it's not PayPal, it's not Disney dollars. It's liquid cash, right? It's liquid cash for a privacy starved society. It's the opt out from that society. How do you get it? You know, there's you, uh, earning it's the best way right now if you want to do it non KYC from an exchange or start using non KYC exchanges like decentralized exchanges. Start using, I guess, what are they? BISC and Huddle Huddle and, and all those ones. And then if you're, you know, if you, if you, if you're able to provide products and services and earn in Bitcoin, do that. Even if it's just on a hobby basis, that's, that's a good way to do it as well. You know, you might not be able to get massive volume, at least initially, but uh, every little helps, right? Uh, you know, it's so important. Just, just the final point on this, because, uh, you know, India has just been in the news recently um, for proposals on, on uh, criminalizing certain cryptocurrency transactions or even just use of cryptocurrency in general. So, and, and I think that's, a, you know, I don't think that's going to either be enforceable or even get past the proposal stage, but you have to think about that. You know, governments change, opinions change, regimes change, attitudes change over time, but those records are going to remain. Yeah, no, those are great points. I, I can't really disagree with you there. That is absolutely a concern for anyone. And it's a trade-off that everyone has to consider about volume right now versus improving their privacy in the here and now. Uh, and I think that might be a good time now to talk about some of the recent uh, news around the funding from Cypherpunk Holdings. So tell us a little bit about this and what is it going to enable for the Samurai Wallet team? Oh, sure. Well, we were really happy to meet with uh, the guys at Cypherpunk. You know, they reached out to us and while we were skeptical at first, uh, we met with them a few times and realized we have a, uh, a shared value system and a shared future, uh, future goal. Uh, which is in, increased transactional privacy in Bitcoin uh, available to all users. And um, yeah, so we were able to raise uh, 100,000 uh, paid in Bitcoin since we're a Bitcoin company. And we're going to be able to well, do two things primarily. One is increase the development capacity on the Android side of things because uh, that's <laughs> very, very pressurized right now. There's only... Uh, one person doing primary development with T, uh, T Dev overseeing things. So getting a, a second person on that team is just going to be so beneficial. And then the second the second person that we're, we're looking to hire is a uh, support a customer support uh, slash QA tester, and that's going to enable us to actually release uh, new functionality quicker. Because right now we're developing quicker than we can release. Uh, we have a very, very uh, comprehensive QA cycle. We need to make sure everything is working as expected and, and properly before it gets uh, rolled out to users. Uh, and with, with one person with support from the rest of the team, but one dedicated person doing that, it's not a, uh, you know, that's not enough capacity. So uh, those are the two main areas of investment that we've highlighted right now. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Hey, like, I mean, you look at uh, the, uh, you know, quote crypto space and you look at the uh you know people like eos and so on who've got like four billion in funding and then and then you guys are here on the other end of the spectrum trying to operate on this sort of shoestring budget to still deliver a product 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's just crazy to me. I can't imagine one even raising that much, that much money. I don't think that would be even appropriate for what we're trying to do. But yeah, I think what, what we raise, it's, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, it's modest. Uh, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna increase the runway dramatically because we're bringing on two additional uh, people, but it's gonna relieve the pressure. And uh, our product is already generating revenue. So, and it's gonna, it has the potential to generate more revenue in the future. So I, you know, this is a, it's a timely investment. I think it's gonna enable us to uh, deliver our product more effectively in the short term without any sort of uh, long-term negative benefits at all. So we're really, we're really excited about, uh, about this and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, further announcements soon around the development of the, uh, of the team and whatnot. Fantastic. And so I've seen, obviously, the recent announcements of Dojo, the release of the Samurai Wallet backend. So, you know, welcome to the Dojo. Let's, uh, let's hear a little bit about what that is and why should the user use this? Oh, sure. Well, so Dojo is, let me see how, it's basically, a, it's a full featured wallet backing server. So basically what makes Samurai run today in our servers in Iceland is Dojo. Everyone who uses Samurai Wallet today is using it via our servers or our Dojo server in Iceland, right? What we've done is open source that, made it freely available to the public and packaged it up in a single script that can be run to install everything uh, self-sufficiently. So why would you use this? Well, if you, like I said, right now, if you're using Samurai Wallet, it's a, our, our Dojo. If you're worried about us tracking you, tracking your payments and then like, you know, reporting those payments uh, and balances and transactions to someone, or you think that we're some sort of honeypot and uh, like NSA honeypot, well then you can completely bypass all of those concerns by running your own dojo and connecting your wallet to it. The other nice, interesting thing is for developers, which we, we're, we're not, you know, overall advertising this because primarily it's, it's uh, designed for wallet users, Samurai wallet users and Sentinel users who wish to have complete sovereignty, right? Not rely on, on us or anyone at all. But developers can also use the built-in wallet API um, to create their own applications that sit on top of Dojo. There's nothing stopping them from doing that. So uh, if they wanted to create their own web wallet or desktop wallet or something like that, Dojo can be used for that purpose as well. Fantastic. So I suppose just to articulate then for some of the listeners, one concern that's been shared in the past is that, oh, if you're using this specific uh, Explorer wallet, meaning that wallet will generally have your XPUB, meaning they will know all of your past transactions and all of your future transactions. However, when you are using something like, for example, Electrum Personal Server or some similar software such as Electra's and so on, or now with Dojo, you are maintaining additional privacy by not leaking out which addresses or XPUB you hold. And so that's that's a really good thing for the privacy aspect. And and uh, I suppose just for you, Samurai Wallet, it's, you know, one of the, you know, call it fair or unfair, um, the knocks against you guys was that while Samurai Wallet has good uh, features from a transaction graph privacy point of view, things like CoinJoin and so on, the, the knock was about internet privacy or rather the the fact of um polling you know that you that it would poll back home to figure out what the balances were which which in fairness is a concern with any mobile pretty much any mobile wallet unless you connect that back to your own full node yes no no i i don't even think that was a knock that was just the case that's true that is what was happening and but the the knock is uh conflating transaction privacy and network privacy because they are two different things so um so yes, we. I mean, since since uh, 2015, we've been very honest and open about what our limitations were. You know, backend limitations. When we first started in 2015, we relied on API information from uh, blockchain.info and then later from various other API prov- uh, uh, sources. That was very very quickly replaced with our own backend, which should later develop into Dojo. And we've always uh, communicated this with the user, and this is this is the primary reason. Samurai Wallet has remained in alpha status for such a long time because I didn't think it was ethical to release a 1.0 product, privacy product to the user and still um, 
either rely on API, uh, like third party APIs, which we stopped in 2017, like I mentioned, but uh, also where they weren't able to uh, overcome the network privacy angle if, they, if that was uh, a concern of theirs. Now, it's not a concern of everyone's. Some people are completely fine uh, phoning home to Samurai Wallet with their XPubs. They don't, they don't have an issue with that. I would, I would, I would uh, suggest that those types of users eventually migrate over to a Dojo-based system because it is better for them long term, but also better for the network long term as well. But there's no, Fantastic. yeah, there's no real issue um, because you know, like you said, almost all light wallets have this limitation where you have to phone home information to them. I mean, that's how they're able to feed back balances and transactions to you. Now, one, I think one sets dojo apart from everything else as far as i can tell right now uh, although we will, we will have some stiff competition in the ease of use factor from uh, pierre's node launcher that's very very easy uh, easy to use from from what i can see is the ease of installation of dojo e even today where we do have one command line instruction that you must install or you must initiate uh it's it's a copy and paste job it's a pretty simple one but that one script in, installs and configures you know, everything you need. Fantastic. So have you had any feedback from the users so far? I, I personally haven't had a chance to test it. Uh, yeah, so, so far so good. We've had uh, quite a few experienced uh, and technical users get their hands dirty and start modifying the Docker script uh, to their own needs. Uh, we've seen uh, in our Telegram group, someone uh, wrote a little tutorial on how to use Dojo with your own copy of Bitcoin D. Because by default, uh, Dojo, like in that one script, like I mentioned, Tor, web server, Bitcoin D, database, the wallet API server, all of that happens automatically. All of it's made of, of uh, accessible via Tor hidden service, so the user doesn't have to worry about networking or anything like that. It starts downloading the blockchain and it begins working right away. You know, So all of that with one command. But some users, especially the more experienced ones, you know, they already have a uh, Bitcoin full node. So we've had a couple, like I said, uh, experienced users write some tutorials, how to use your own Bitcoin full node, how to uh, use the Tor layer in Dojo with Wasabi Wallet, if you have that on the same device. So there's all sorts of stuff coming, and I suspect more is coming down the line. And I think for the more casual users, they're going to wait until uh, hardware with, with Dojo pre-installed and pre-loaded. you know pre -loaded and pre-configured up to a certain point because that's then they don't have to really do anything. It's, it's plug and play. Fantastic. And can you talk to us a little bit about what you're thinking in terms of pairing? So if you've got your Samurai wallet on my mobile, how do I pair that back to my Dojo? What's the proposed method? Oh, yeah, it, it's really simple. So, so once you've uh, installed Dojo, once that script I mentioned finishes, you, you'll be presented with a um, onion address. Uh, Tor onion address. And what you can do is just navigate to that address with uh, any Tor browser. Uh, enter in your, your configured password that you entered. This is you logging into your management screen of Dojo. And this is accessible either on the Dojo device or remotely anywhere. Um, you just have to have a nice strong password. Uh, and then the first thing you see when you log into this admin uh, section is a QR code. And all you need to do is open your Samurai wallet um, and scan the QR code, and what and it will connect to Dojo, and it won't use our servers anymore. Now, I will recommend that users who want to use Dojo in the most privacy-effective way actually create a new wallet and connect it to Dojo before it ever touches our servers. Because if you connect your existing wallet to your own Dojo, that doesn't mean that you're you know, um, that we didn't know about your XPub before, right? So we could still derive addresses for it if we wanted to, and, and we could still see what your balance is, and we could still see transaction history on those XPubs, even though we're, we're not, and that would just waste re resources on our end. We could do, theoretically. Fantastic advice. Yeah, so I would recommend creating a new wallet which you can pair to Dojo before anything is sent out over the net, right? You can also create a wallet offline and then later uh, connect it to Dojo. There's multiple ways you can do it, but that's just 
a personal suggestion. Yeah, no, I think that's a great advice for the listeners out there as well, because it's it's similar, like if you've used a Trezor, for example, and then connected to the Trezor web service, well, now they've got the XPUB. So yeah. at any point now, any prior transactions or any future transactions on that same XPUB, they will know about. Yeah. So that's just a good uh, advice there for uh, listeners who are um, just wondering how what's the best, most private way to use this. And uh, look, let's, Samurai Wallet, let's now talk a little bit about the hardware product. So as I understand, you're looking to do a collaboration and get some hardware products rolling out. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. So we were uh, initially initially working on a hardware product with uh, Bitseed, which is just a, a super OG company. You know, they, they kind of created the concept of the at-home, always-on node, and they, they started selling hardware for that really early on. Um, unfortunately, you know, as, as people may have heard, uh, they've decided to shut down operations recently. Um, so we are not able to provide the hardware node on, on the BitSeed at this time. So that's going to delay launch of a hardware product uh, by a little bit. It, it, it's not a serious issue uh, because I'm, I can't announce, and I don't think this has been announced anywhere yet, so this is a Levera exclusive. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I can announce that we've had really engaging and uh, successful discussions with the Nodal team, um, so Keto Miner and those guys, and they've agreed to um, do a exclusive Samurai Edition uh, Nodal, which will include no, well, one. Let, let, most importantly, it will be red which is the most requested uh, <laughs> feature. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, uh, you should see our Telegram group. You know, there's almost outrage at the prospect of it not being red. Um, but it will, it will uh, include um, enhanced hardware from the stock Dojo uh, Nodal, and uh, it will come with Dojo pre-installed and Whirlpool as well, which is our mixing uh, protocol. So it's a, you know, we're sad about uh, Bitseed. We wish we could have gone further with them, but we are very, very happy and uh, excited to be working with the Nodal team. And uh, that will be the official Samurai uh, Dojo hardware. And that will be the only Samurai Dojo hardware. So we're very happy about that. Fantastic. I mean, I've got a Nodal myself and I really enjoyed using it. And uh, listeners, if you're interested, I actually did do an episode earlier with uh, Ask Ueto and Keto Miner from the Nodal team. So check that out. Um, but yeah, Samurai Wallet, that's fantastic news. I think there's actually an important point um, for existing Nodal uh, owners. They're going to be able to install Dojo for free uh, via the App Store, of course. So they're not going to have to go buy a new Nodal, uh, a nodal for this. For uh, anyone I I existing getting a Samurai Edition nodal. Uh, like I said, you get enhanced hardware, but you also get some additional uh, features and uh, perks that we're going to announce later on. So there is some incentive. Besides supporting Samurai uh, and nodal, there is some incentive to for purchasing a Samurai Edition nodal. So we're looking forward to... Right, and you get the red one, right? Well, <laughs> Most well, importantly. Red, red is faster. I think that's a scientifically proven uh, <laughs> So... You know, that's a benefit in itself. But, uh, I mean, we're t it's going to be very nice. It's a premium product. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, we're talking metal. We're talking laser etched and, and significant specs. So I think a lot of people are going to like it. And there, there, there may be another uh, in-between uh, product at, at a lower co uh, price point as well. But that's all still being determined. Um, but as soon as existing nodal users are able to... Um, or as soon as the uh, the integration software integration is complete, which is already being worked on at Nodal, uh, existing Nodal users will be able to um, have a very simple installation process for for Dojo. So that's that's that will be coming very soon. That will come before the actual uh, hardware is ready. I'm sure. Yeah, that's fantastic because then if you've got kind of a newbie friend and they've got money and and their time poor, you can just tell them to get a Nodal and then they can already have you know, a, a more private version of using Bitcoin because now they're already using, if they want, the Samurai Wallet paired with their Noddle and therefore it's not polling out to any public servers like, say, a public Electrum server and so on. I mean, people are speculating that some of those public Electrum servers are, tech, or theoretically, they're being run by some of these chain analysis companies to try and... Certain. Yeah. 
to sort of cluster people's balances and uh, try to figure out, you know, who is spending what. And now I guess that ties in nicely to our next topic, which is... Suck it. One second. If That was a great point you just made, and I just wanted to expand on it really quickly. Yeah, sure. If you have... Uh, you, you mentioned the friend who uh, has some money, but, you know wants to wants to interact privately but you also may have friends who don't have enough money to purchase a nodal but they also want to interact privately well of course they're able to um install dodo for free but they may not be technical well they could minimize trust by connecting to your no uh, your dojo or you know what so you don't have to run your own particular dojo maybe you want to onboard your family and friends away from samurai servers onto your controlled dojo this doesn't decrease your privacy. It just means that you can derive and track balances of your friends and family who, who connect to it. But there's no security implications for doing so. So you can kind of act as your own small uh, wallet backend provider, if you understand what I mean, for your family. Exactly. And I think that's a great point. I think we, I, I might have even touched on that, listeners. You might have listened in the earlier episode with Thomas Bloomer. We talked about this idea of even not necessarily decentralizing out to every single person running their own node, but at least if you could get it to the point where people might have one for the family or one for amongst your trusted friends. Maybe you've got like a techie friend and they're the guy who runs the node for your little group of friends. I mean, obviously it's not perfect, but it is superior to the public sort of server model. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I just wanted to make that point because I don't think it's been, uh, well, I guess you have touched on it, but it hasn't been uh, as widely um, consumed yet. But it's a, it is a strong point. It is a strong point. Yeah, and I think that to, in fairness, it's you know it's much much harder if like everyone who runs a noddle or every kind of technical person who can run their own dojo for their friends and family. That's a lot harder for you know people to spy on you now because now they've got to go and you know basically get into all of those other technical users setups which is much more difficult than just going to say public electrum servers or running electrum public servers exactly absolutely right all right so turning now to transaction graph privacy which is more around things like doing coin joins and so on we've got whirlpool so just for the listeners so they know, I've actually been participating in some of the beta testing of the Whirlpool, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, but Samurai Wallet, I'll just give you an opportunity now to just intro it. Tell us what is Whirlpool and what are the benefits from a privacy perspective? Okay, sure. Uh, so Whirlpool is an implementation of uh, Zero Link, which is a Chalmium coin join protocol. It allows multiple uh, parties to come together and join their their coins or UTXOs um, in, in one transaction that is beneficial mutually for their privacy and coincidentally for the fungibility of the network at whole. Um, it's privacy based on pure mathematics. It's not stealth. It's not deception. Um, there's a trade-off to that being that a, a Whirlpool uh, transaction has a distinctive fingerprint. We have mitigation for that with our post-mix spending tools, which you can touch on in a little bit. Uh, those are deception stealth-based, but this is a purely mathematical-based um, privacy tool. Uh, let's see, touch points. Whirlpool is um, entirely non-custodial, of course, meaning the user, key, uh, user retains uh, full control of their private keys at all times. Um, and privacy, the benefits from a privacy perspective really, I think, come to uh, fruition at scale. You know, the more people using CoinJoin for more transactions creates a transaction graph that is more resistant to all sorts of uh, blockchain analysis and heuristics. When you can't, when you can't determine with any amount of confidence the ownership of inputs to outputs, which is effectively what Whirlpool does, it severs that link of inputs to outputs. And you can't relate um, to previously seen transactions, what do you even have as a basis point, right? You have a system where it isn't trivially easy to peek into the private financial lives of users and a system where broad assumptions can no longer be packaged up and sold by chain analysis firms and be taken seriously because this gets right at the heart of those, breaks those assumptions. And it creates something where Bitcoin is more like physical cash. You don't know or care where the history of your physical bills came from. doesn't matter. This kind of enforces that, yeah. Right. And 
I think it might be illustrative now. So during the beta testing, some of the stuff we were doing is we would run, we would see a Whirlpool Mix Go, and then we would go to the website kycp.org and look at that TX ID. And what it would show is the inputs and the outputs. And maybe you want to just touch on that, Samurai Wallet, and what, what does it look like there? <laughs> what does it look like visually? Well, I guess more the aspect of how there's not deterministic links. Yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you both visually. Imagine you you know that that drawer with all your cables in it. You know all the discarded USB cables and printer cables and stray corded mice and all that. And the cables get all tangled up. It, it looks like that visually. And KYCP is a visual tool, so it shows inputs and outputs and all the different combinations that those inputs can be connected to those outputs. And the result, it looks like spaghetti. On a, on a technical level, what you're seeing is every single Whirlpool transaction, every single mix transaction consists of what's called a 100% maximum entropy for a transaction with five inputs and five outputs. That is what a standard Whirlpool transaction is right now. So 100% maximum entropy for a transaction of that composition, five inputs and five outputs is 10.54 bits and entropy for uh, you know, the layman terms is how many possible mappings of inputs to outputs are possible uh, so that comes down to about uh, almost 1500 different ways of interpreting the transaction it's, it's 1496 uh, additionally there's zero previously seen transactions in the same mix additional to that there are zero deterministic links between input to output uh, as far as an external uh, observer is concerned, mathematically, the probability of input to output being linked in a Whirlpool mix is 34.22% each way. Uh, there's zero address reuse and zero identifiable fee address uh, within the mix. So these conditions are structural. They hold true if we decide to do in the future 10 inputs and 10 outputs, uh, 20 inputs and 20 outputs, it doesn't matter. Uh, the only thing that changes is that with the more inputs and outputs, the higher the potential entropy and uh, the lower the link probability. So it wouldn't be more than 10 bits and the link probability would be less than 34. So it just gets better uh, the more you Excellent. So let's talk about the setup now. So I understand. So during the beta testing, we've got the different pool sizes, right? So we had 0.01 BTC and 0.05 BTC or 1 million sats and 5 million sats. Can you tell us a little bit about the setup there? And then just tell us, go into the little, a bit of the process on using it. Oh, okay, sure. So uh, like, yeah, like you said, we have um, two pools currently. When we launch the full, full release, we'll actually have three pools. You choose the pool you want to mix in based on the total amount you are mixing and the desired uh, denom denomination outcome. Let's see. You pay a, a one-time pool entrance fee. You say that you pay the same uh, flat entrance fee no matter the volume you are mixing. So one Bitcoin costs the same to mix as you know a thousand Bitcoins. This has specifically been designed not to be a fee trap. We wanted to make this as open as possible to the widest number of users as possible. Uh, if used correctly, all the we provide the the features I just listed above. You know, I just said all that. We provide all of that very very low rate per mix UTXO because it's a one time fee. Once you're in the pool, you can mix as long as you want at no additional cost or minor fees. Uh, the more mixes your coins are involved in, the greater the overall anonymity set, and the lower the overall cost per anon set is. So. We, we've designed a system, I think, that encourages users to mix and stick around and provide liquidity and help others mix in return for getting free mixes before they actually have to spend. So they, they just are increasing their privacy and providing privacy to others. Fantastic. So let me just summarize that up again, just for the listeners to help make sure everyone's following along. So as I understand it, you've got, when you open up Whirlpool, it's got Whirlpool CLI for desktop. There is a deposit oh, oh, window. Wait, I, I think yep. we need to, sorry, sorry. I, I, I think we need to differentiate between what you're testing right now and um, which is the desktop uh, beta version and what, what most people are going to end up using, which is the mobile-based mixing. See, 
Whirlpool is, has been designed from a mobile first perspective from the start, meaning it's designed with a smaller amount of inputs and outputs, five instead of 10, 20, 30, whatever, uh, for quicker confirmation uh, or right, quicker cycling. And this is to accommodate you know, the way people use mobile apps and the restrictions on background connectivity on mobile apps. Now, the desktop version, that's designed uh, for users um, who wish to, to enter a mixing pool and remain there for, for longer period of time, continuously mixing their coins. And they can do that all very simply, either uh, through the, uh, through the uh, GUI app or through the command line app. And, and that basically allows the pool to, to um, allows you to provide liquidity to the pool on a 24 hour basis, right? So you're constantly remixing your UTXOs. That's long-term or um, you know, uh, always on connectivity. Whereas the mobile mixing is bursty and it's on demand. I need a mix right now. And Whirlpool is so fast that it's totally possible. It's no problem. You can press the mix button and it's very likely that your coin will be mixed in the blink of an eye when there's enough liquidity in the pool. So it's important to, to uh, discuss each one individually because they're two different um, kind of user groups. You don't need to use the desktop app. All right. So let's talk through a little bit around the structure of what it looks like when the user is actually doing the mix. I mean, it might be slightly different from how I've done it in the testing, but what I've seen is when the user has those UTXOs or specific coins in the deposit window, they would then click TX0 and that will then do a few things. It will first, one of the things it does is it takes the fee for Samurai. That's where Samurai Wallet takes the cut. And then it's now in the premix pool. And then from the premix aspect, that's where it's sort of waiting to get mixed. So can you just outline a little bit of the process and what's the typical flow there for the user? Yeah, sure. So, so that's a, exactly correct. Uh, I think it's important to explain the TX zero concept. So we have to dive in a little technically there. Um, so as you explained, the TX0 is the setup of the transaction prior to any mixing taking place. Now on the desktop app, like you mentioned, you can select one UTXO at a time. Um, that limitation doesn't exist in the mobile version where you can select multiple UTXOs to merge into one TX0. But in any case, when you choose UTXOs to be mixed, they are added to the input side of a TX0 while the output side is divided into like size amounts based on the pool chosen, where the pool fee is paid, as you mentioned, and where the unmixed change is then returned to the quarantined, uh, quarantined account zero, or deposit account, as it's on, uh, mentioned on the desktop app. Now, from the TX zero, each like size output so if you're in the 0, 0, 005 pool, that becomes a single input within a five input whirlpool, uh, whirlpool mix. Users uh, will never mix with themselves in each one of these five input whirlpool mixes. And the same TX0 never uh, directly contributes more than one UTXO to a mix. So it, it really, it's hard to kind of visualize, but what it ends up looking like if you do visualize it, and I've, I've put some visual uh, visualization on, on um, Twitter, it looks kind of like a branch, like a tree branch breaking off and going off into many different segments. And, and each time it branches, it just gets more and more obfuscated away. Um, so, so once each output of that, um, initial TX0 has been consumed, it is considered mixed and it's added to a segregated account we call postmix. So the premix side of things that you see in your desktop client or what we label as premix, um, in, in actual production use, and when we've tested this, stress tested this on, on testnet, for example, you barely ever see it, the UTXO in that account because it goes from premix to postmix so fast. Right, so it goes TX0 to postmix essentially, or at least what it looks like visually to the user uh, when, when there's enough volume within the system. Excellent. And so 
maybe while we're on this point, can you talk to us a little bit about pre and post mix and how should customers manage this and think about this, right? So should the customers be manually managing their UTXOs such that they do not mix? Like let's say later, they now want to spend out of that post mix. They've obviously got to be careful not to spend that together with any pre mix. Uh, can you talk to to us a little bit about that process and whether maybe the wallet helps them not make that mistake? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this is this is a, such an important point, and I'm glad you brought it up. They shouldn't have to think about it too much at all. It, I think is the is the right answer to that. Uh, as little they should have to think about it as little as possible. From the user perspective, all they should need to do is choose one or more UTXOs that they wish to mix and the pool size that they wish to mix in. That's that's basically it. Once it's mixed and they eventually want to spend, they can utilize one of the post-mix spending tools that we've built, and they can transact their, their mixed coin safely without the, uh, with the least amount of degradation to their privacy as possible. Every, every spend out of Whirlpool post-mix is at least a stonewall. But we also have stonewall times two and stowaway, which are mini coin joins. Right? We, can, we can talk about that in a second. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But each each spend is enforced as at least a stone wall, and what we've seen is that stone walls that come from the post mix tend to score significantly higher in entropy uh, than stone walls are originating from the account zero or deposit account, which basically uh, validates our approach of proposing post mix tools and encouraging people to actually spend their their mixed coins because that's really the important part. You need to pollute the graph and you do that by spending your mixed coins, not just mixing your coin. Fantastic. And another little point that users might not have initially thought about, but I, as I saw that come up from testing is sometimes once you do that TX0, you end up with these little bits left over. Do you have a concept around mixing the change? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So one, having multiple pool sizes is really powerful for this, this issue. Um, so if, if we have a, um, a pool size that can accommodate the unmixed change amount, we'll propose that you automatically mix the change. Um, but structurally, Whirlpool is handled, or, or sorry, is equipped to handle uh, unmixed change better than other implementations, as far as I can tell. As well, yeah, a, a lot of thought has gone into this, and this is, this I think is really where it comes down to shine. And I think now that your you, uh, your listeners hopefully understand the TX zero process, the fact that the change unmixed change gets sent back from TX zero into the account zero, the deposit account, which is segregated completely from the post mix account means you cannot link the two UTXOs together. The wallet doesn't allow it. So you can safely spend those UTXOs if you don't care. That's not a problem. It's not a serious issue. But you can also do something like marking that change as do not spend or choosing to merge all those little unmixed change UTXOs into a single new TX0 once enough has accumulated for the smallest size pool. And the pool sizes aren't set. We can open new ones at will. It's easy. It's just about market um, desire. You know, so if the market dictates we need a, a small pool to like consolidate dust, basically, I'm sure there, then we can easily uh, implement such a thing. Fantastic. All right. So now let's talk about when should users be looking to do a Whirlpool mix. So now a couple of examples I can think of. One would be before or after doing some kind of cash deal for Bitcoin, because if you're regularly dealing with somebody and they decide to do chain analysis on that TXID, they might figure out, oh, you know, this samurai wallet guy, he's got a lot of Bitcoins, right? And then the other one might be potentially using after buying from an exchange. But what's the samurai wallet view there? Well, both of those, both of those uh, are absolutely uh, legitimate uh, use cases for for using Whirlpool or CoinJoin in general. Uh, also, um, mixing uh, UTXOs with high address reuse, like static donation addresses. You know, there's all sorts of little things, reasons why, but ultimately, you should be doing it all the time. The more coin joins, the better, and the more spends that pollute the address and transaction graphs, the better. 
meaning you should aim to spend UTXOs that have been mixed solely. You shouldn't be looking to spend your unmixed UTXOs. Not, there's no reason to anymore, not with Whirlpool. It's not about having things to hide, right? I think that's super important to get, get across. It's not about having things to hide. It's about protecting your financial privacy. It's about protecting your business's competitiveness in the market. And it's, and it's the overall fungibility of the network. So all the time. Look, let's now t- turn to some of the Samurai Wallet features and talk through a little bit of that. Now, one thing I've seen TDEV often say, he often says, make every spend a coin join. So can you just articulate for the listeners what's, what's, the, what's behind that? Well, uh, Samurai Wallet, I, I think, uh, is the only mobile wallet, certainly, but only potentially wallet to to allow users to create coin join tran- uh, transactions as part of an actual spend. So this is different to Whirlpool, where mixing and spending are two distinct steps. Right, you initiate a mix, and then you initiate a spend. Uh, we have functionality that allows you to mix as you spend, so coin join as you spend. So this is where this is coming from. And then when you when you think about it, and I keep going back at this, but it's so important. Each coin join in, is a drop of poison in the water supply uh, of the transaction graph. It's it, it's it, it directly attacks those who are trying to build a business model on destroying the fungibility of the Bitcoin token. This impacts everyone who uses Bitcoin. And with every whirlpool, with every stowaway, and with every stonewall, the reliability and the accuracy of their data set is reduced. So let's talk a little bit about stowaway, uh, what it is, and how to use it. Sure. So stowaway, um, it's also known as PayJoin. Um, uh, Waxwing implemented it as PayJoin in Join Market uh, very well. Oh, very good implementation. And this is a coin join where you cannot you cannot actually tell it's a coin join. It appears to be a quote unquote simple spend. So meaning a, a transaction with two outputs, presumably the destination output and then one being the change back. So this is what a simple spend looks like. And a stowaway replicates this fingerprint of a simple spend, but it's not. It's a coin join. And all the analysis platforms, OXT, Wallet Explorer, uh, Blockstream.info, they all incorrectly identify these transactions as belonging to a single wallet entity. And they're all wrong. And as the operator of OXT, we couldn't be happier about breaking it. That's exactly what we want to see. Fantastic. So let's just quickly talk through uh, if you could just touch on the user flow for that. So, you know, you fire it up in your wallet and then you can you just explain that as well? So right now it only exists in an experimental capacity within the wallet. It, it's usable and people are using it regularly. It's just not there's no UI surrounding it yet. That's one of the developments that is being tested in QA and is being backlogged right now. So what it will be is a, a sort of peer to peer method of of com- uh, composing transactions. So these are really good for in-person. When you and a friend uh, are together and you want to compose a transaction together, and all you need to do is scan QR codes when you're instructed to do so. Then the wallet will instruct you to do so. It's, it, it's a very peer-to-peer mixing method. Very cool. Uh, Stonewall X uh, times two is an additional type of transaction that's also a two-person coin join. And that also works in the same way, uh, although it's a little bit easier uh, to initiate these types of the Stonewall X2 transaction uh, remotely uh, between participants. So we have some more information coming out about that later on. But both both of these types of transactions, Stonewall uh, X2 and Stowaway, they make use of two participants. And the idea is it pollutes the, the graph. It's a stealth and deception-based privacy. They're either clustered. They're yeah. They're either clustered by analysis when they, uh, whether they're one wallet or two wallets. So you know the fingerprinting is completely broken, or they're they're flagged as potential coin join by, by uh, Blockstream.info. Wh- whether they're one wallet or two, so the co- the fingerprint's broken. So and again, these are not. This is not a slight on any of those services. Those all those services and ours included OXT are relying on the known and accepted. Um, analysis heuristics and accepted 
uh, standards that, like for example, simple spends, where one wallet controls all the the um, inputs of a simple spend. That's just not true anymore. So attacking that is is fundamental, and that's why uh, T Dev says make every spend a coin join. Excellent. So I guess I'll just quickly try and summarize that for the listeners and just paraphrase just to make sure everyone's sort of following along. One of the most common heuristics, and there are many heuristics, right? But the most common one is what's known, I think Chris Belcher calls it the common input owner heuristic. And the idea is if a wallet is spending from multiple UTXOs into one or wherever, it's assumed that that was one person. And so I think what I would articulate then is Stowaway and Stonewall X2 are sort of, or times two, are doing two separate things. One of them, so Stowaway is making it look like, one of them is making it look like it is a, it is not a coin join when it is. Yeah. And the other one, if I understand you, is then trying to make it look like a coin join, even though it is not. And in doing so, it's helping break the heuristic on which chain analysis and those companies are relying on. Is that correct? Yeah, so stowaway or pay join is that's correct exactly. It it, it it targets that heuristic and it breaks the assumption that the owner of all the inputs are the same person on a simple spend transaction. Correct. Uh, Stonewall uh, X two or times two, uh, it makes use of two participants in a transaction that follow the exact same rules as a one person Stonewall, and a one person Stonewall has been on the market now for a long time. And a one-person Stonewall is a false decoy coin join, but mathematically looks like a coin join. So now what we've done with, with adding Stonewall X2 in there is basically polluting the fingerprint of Stonewall. So when you find a, a, a transaction that may look like a Stonewall, you can no longer say whether it's one person or two person. Or, or three person or four person or five person. It, 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 again, it's just about chipping away at the confidence of what it is these these entities, uh, these chain uh, analysis entities are collecting and and um, making a, uh, on behalf of us. It, it, it's absurd, especially especially when they're licensing this data and, and handing this data over to active investigations and active law enforcement um, proceedings. It's irresponsible. It's not about it being law enforcement. It's about them giving law enforcement who are working on an active investigation bad, weak information. It's snake oil. And this will hopefully, the more that people use it and the more that other services implement these types of tools, the less that's going to be an issue. Excellent. And now with... The there's another feature, so it's called Ricochet. So we touched on this the first time you were on the episode. Um, I think it might be interesting just to clarify that Ricochet itself is not it's not meant to be a coin join, right? It's meant no. to be more like placing distance between a certain UTXO at one point in time and then say four steps later or four hops later where it goes to an exchange. And the idea might be that theoretically you might use a Ricochet before sending to an exchange such that the exchange does not kind of blacklist or not accept your coins. Could you articulate there? Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely correct. It, it's, it's essential to understand Ricochet isn't a privacy tool. It's a deniability tool. That's what it is. Um, so as, as, you see, as you mentioned, most, most services look back four or five hops. Um, this is a very, very lazy way of doing an analysis, but this is what most do. And if it flags anything in their database, they can reject the transaction or, or you know, flag it or, or do something. So Ricochet aims to get a, a, around this this issue and, and thus far has seemed to have been working very successfully for our users. It's a very popular feature. Um, and and uh, we've recently updated this feature because uh, one of the valid criticisms of, of Ricochet was that there's a very distinctive fingerprint on the blockchain. If you're if you're looking at the you know anything other than just a dumb analysis of jumping back five hops, if you're a human or or anything like that, you'll or uh, an algorithm that's been properly coded, you'll notice that. So that's that was completely justified. Although it wasn't that we were trying to get around that, we were trying to just circumvent these blanket sort of blacklists. Um, but we decided, hey. This is actually 
a valid a valid criticism. Let's let's do something about it. And we came up with um, ricochet with staggered uh, through staggered blocks, meaning that you still get the um, the history associated, the hops of history associated with a ricochet. However, they don't all confirm within the same block or they aren't all sequentially after each other. They will confirm in multiple different blocks at, at different points. Um, and this can take, you know, between like 30 minutes and a, and a few hours, depending on the mining fee used and, and how things things work. So it's a little, it's a slightly different use case. You know, you're not going to use ricochet staggered if you want to sell to like Coinbase or something really quickly but if you want to move things over and you're not in a time uh crunch it's a great it's a great great tool it doesn't cost any more than a standard ricochet um so uh, i completely recommend it and one of the cool things is tying it back to dojo um if you are running your own dojo your your dojo will be used as the um the dark mempool where that tr those transactions those hops sit waiting to be broadcast to the network because we do not let the the transactions sit in the mempool all at the same time or else they'd be subject to time correlation attacks even though you staggered them so they sit out of the mempool in a local dojo mempool waiting for their time to shine so to speak <laughs> very nice so i think that's the key features we're looking to talk about let's now talk a bit about documentation and guides for some of these products and services have you had any user created guides or videos and do, is that something you encourage is that something you're looking for them to do oh absolutely that's like one of the things that we could really use the most help on and we like i said earlier in the in the chat i think uh, we've had we've had a couple guides come in around dojo into our telegram group that have just been just been great and we encourage anyone who who uh, wants to put together a guide a video a tutorial to put one together we're, we're, we're trying to figure out ways of highlighting them uh without taking you know responsibility over them so it's like a, do your own research don't you know don't contact us if you screw things up too bad but feel free to tinker because you can't really screw things up that bad you know it is only it's all public key based right so if you if you really mess things up you can just start again um, so yeah, no, uh, and anything that people can contribute would be great. We, we do have some official video guides, uh, but again, we don't have a team dedicated for that and I'm the person that does them. So I have to find time to do them. I think that, yeah, that about covers it on the, on the documentation. More is better. So please, please help. Excellent. All right. Um, and I think my listeners will definitely want me to ask this. So I'm going to ask it again. Uh, when is there an iPhone app coming out? Um, well, you know, I, I it's not been easy to find an iOS uh, developer who who shares the same kind of passion and and drive that we do about this. It's, it seems to be a little bit more difficult uh, to find that skill set on on that platform versus Android. Uh, so when when we're able to, we will. But it's not in the cards anytime soon. I wouldn't hold my breath for iOS anytime soon. We have a lot a lot to get done uh, on Android, on desktop, on on various various things so you know I, I would like to be on iOS from a product point of view believe me but from a develop, development point of view and a financial point of view it just it's not in the cards right now understandable yeah I mean I'm an Android guy myself so it's not an issue for me but uh, for those iPhone guys out there you're gonna have to uh, you have to hold on for a bit longer what well, I will I will be I will uh, I will leave a little morsel attempting morsel we are working on ways of um, bridging other wallets into Whirlpool. So maybe there, sh there could be some sort of iOS app that will allow users of other wallets on iOS, for example, to engage in Whirlpool. They will have some options available to them, perhaps. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing. I think mobile mixing is... Uh... Uh, up until you guys came along, it's uh, not really been happening. So hopefully, you know, we get a bit of um, more people who are able to use that if they would like to. Um, so look, let's. I think that's pretty much it for time. So just let the listeners know, those of them who haven't got Samurai Wallet or if they want more info, where should they go? Oh, well, you can visit us on SamuraiWallet.com. Following us on Twitter is probably the best way to keep updated on what's going on because we're, we're often communicating that way. And that's uh, at Samurai Wallet. And uh, you can find our group on Telegram as well. I believe that's Samurai Wallet as well. 
Excellent. Well, we'll put the links in the show notes as well for the listeners. And I think that's pretty much going to do it for this episode. So thank you, Samurai Wallet, for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. It's been great. I hope you guys enjoyed that discussion with Samurai Wallet, and I hope you are inspired to also go and try out some of this stuff. So try out Dojo, try out Whirlpool Mixing, and also if you're getting a lot of value out of this, chances are your friends and family will too, so make sure you share the episode with them, help arm them with the knowledge of how to preserve their Bitcoin privacy, share it around on Reddit, Twitter, Telegram, whatever. Also, just a quick shout out for the people who've left me a really nice review. I'm currently sitting at an average of 5.0 stars across 181 ratings globally, so I really appreciate any ratings and reviews you guys can leave me because that helps new people find me. And you can also find the show notes on my website, stefanlevera.com. This is episode 78. That's it from me. Thanks, guys, and I'll speak to you soon.